Rub up your engines! Well, guess how many Ford Rangers Ford sold in February? Zero. <laughs> I didn't sell a single one. <laughs> and they sold 34% less Broncos than they did before, right? Now, what's up? Well, the problem with the Rangers is they're having a problem building them. They're having problems. Their new model's coming out later, right? Scratch my chin on that one. If you know anything about cars, the new models generally come out sometimes as early as June or July. Right? So in June or July of 2023, you can usually buy 2024s, right? Well, now in February, you couldn't even buy a 2024 Ranger because they didn't have any, I guess. They didn't sell a single one. And they sold 34% less Broncos. Well, the Broncos don't surprise me at all. With all the engine problems and stuff they have, they've got a very bad reputation. And the Bronco Sports are the worst because those are the ones that are made in Mexico. At least the other Broncos are made in the United States, right? But the Bronco Sports are made in Mexico. They have all kinds of problems with them. They didn't sell a single Ford Ranger in February. And oh, gee, old Jim Farley says he's going to clean up Ford and fix all the problems. Maybe he's going to fix them all by not selling any cars at all. <laughs> you won't have any problems. You don't make any cars, right? Well, our cars didn't break at all last month. We didn't sell any, but what the heck? <laughs> Well, I guess one Ford dealership will do anything to get people to come in and buy their cars because they're having a hard time selling them. Believe it or not, there is Sarasota Ford dealership that has a new restaurant inside called Le Mans Kitchen. The restaurant isn't open to the general public, only to the dealership's customers who can have a free meal and drink while they buy or service their car. The chef... Buying the restaurant is Jose Martinez, a Michelin-starred chef who also owns Maison Blanche, a fine dining restaurant on Longbow Key. So they're having a swanky restaurant, creme bleu and everything at a Ford dealership to try to get people to come in and buy their cars. And then when you're getting serviced and they're really taking you for a ride like they do at all dealerships, you can enjoy a free meal on them. Now your oil change might cost you $800, but you'll get a free meal out of it. Hey, they're really going to the bottom of the barrel now to try to get people to come in to the car dealerships. <laughs> Anytime they tell you something is free, that means you're going to pay double or triple for it. And what else are you paying for? It's like the people years ago, they used to say, you got a free TV if you buy a car from us. Blah, blah. You know how you got the free TV? They just amortized that TV into your monthly payment. So if the TV was 500 bucks, it would just add that $500 of payments into your monthly payments. It was not a free TV. You were paying for it, right? And in this case, you're not getting free food. You're either buying a car from them and they're making a profit, or you're having them work on your car, and they're certainly going to get you a whopping big bill, a lot more than it would be to buy the lunch yourself. <laughs> Alexis W. says, what could cause my truck to act weird after sitting for two days? I got no 7 Tundra with 245,000 miles. My truck sat for three days when I was out of town. I started, it smelled weird, had a little gray white smoke coming out. When I shifted park to drive, it had a little delay. Kind of shifted hard at first, now it's back to normal. If there's something going on. Vehicles aren't made to sit, but three days is not much. Now, you said it acted a little bit weird and you had a little smoke. Understand one main thing. Car batteries have to create a certain amount of voltage. If it gets below and the battery's worn, and it's at for three days, so it'll be a little bit lower, right? If you don't get enough voltage and amperage to all your devices, it's going to run weird. So, you could get smoke coming out because the ignition system and the fuel system wasn't working right. In your case, you have an electronically controlled automatic transmission. It might shift weird in the beginning until the battery gets recharged, and then it'll go normal. So, this is what makes a logical thing. Go to a guy like me who knows what he's doing, have him load test your battery. You'll probably find your battery is weak and it's time to replace the battery. And that makes total sense. Now, if not, there's something funky going on, that something is wearing in the car, fuel injection system or whatever. But 99% of the time in a Toyota, that is just a bad battery. And the battery's weak. And even though it starts the vehicle, it doesn't have enough electricity in the beginning to run everything. But then once you warm it up, 
The alternator recharges the battery and then it runs totally normal. So get it load tested. You probably just need a new battery. B-Dog 1998 says my 12 volt outlet doesn't work. I got an 03 Chevy Silverado. I was blowing up a pool float in my truck with a tire inflator and then my 12 volt outlet in the passenger side isn't working. I checked the fuse and they seem to be fine. Okay, here's the thing. This is a good warning for a lot of people. Those outlets aren't made for much power. They just aren't. And if you start plugging a bunch of stuff in it, it will often either blow the fuse or melt the wiring inside the cigarette lighter. Well, they call it a power outlet now, right? Best if you use one of those cheap Chinese pumps. Who knows what kind of amperage it has if it's shortened out itself. My advice is for anybody who wants to inflate stuff with air compressors, do like I do. My good air compressor that I keep in the car has two clamps on it. They clamp directly to the battery then you're bypassing the entire wiring system of the car and you're only using the battery. And the pump itself has its own wire, so it's set up that it will work perfectly fine. It's not gonna blow a fuse or melt anything because it was designed for that. The ones that you plug in the cigarette lighters are not a good thing to use very often because often they're cheap Chinese junk that doesn't work, that can short things out, or they take too much power for that rated fuse and they'll blow the fuse. Now, if you look around, you got a bunch of fuse boxes on that thing. You probably blew a fuse somewhere. Now, if you didn't, you have burned out the little socket itself because what you got, it's a 21 year old Chevy and those sockets only work so long. Plug in, plug out, plug in, plug out and eventually they break too. So it could be you need a new socket. You might check that. Get yourself a test light, right? And if the fuses are all good and you stick a test light in and you see it doesn't have power or ground when you test it, then you know you're going to need a new socket assembly. They do wear out over time. They're not made for much power. Lakeside says, I got a 2024 Toyota Prius PHEV plug-in. After the first few weeks, the car uses almost all the time pure battery for up to 60 kilometers an hour, then the hybrid kicks in. Lately, I noticed it's been using mainly gas or battery, even though I keep it fully charged every night and drive in EV mode. I had it in EV mode and I drive conservatively. It's been cold this week. Could that factor in? What should I do? Okay, well, cold weather is going to affect plug-in hybrids for sure. They got a smaller electric battery. And you're talking about going up to 60 kilometers an hour. That's not all that fast, right? If you find that... It's no longer doing that, and it's using a motor a lot more, and it's cold outside. The cold weather's obviously affecting it. Now, what you want to do is this. See what happens in the summer. You just bought it. It's a 2024. When it gets warm outside, if it keeps kicking out, it won't go far. Take it back to Toyota. There's got to be a problem with it. Those are very highly complex cars, those plug-in hybrids. All kinds of complexity in those things. So it might be that it's screwed up. It's brand new. You know, it should go definitely further, even if it's somewhat cold. It's a brand new vehicle. The battery isn't worn out yet. So see what happens in the spring when it starts warming up. And if you still have hardly any range with the electric plug-in, take it to Toyota. That's a problem because the ones that I've seen, they'll go 55 miles. Even if you're going 60 miles an hour until they run out a certain amount of power, they get down to like 15% or something, then they'll kick the motor in. Well, scientists say they're working on another battery breakthrough, and this one is using tea to make battery material. Well, the stems from the tea leaves turns them into carbon and it uses that carbon as a basis of the battery system. Now, these are sodium ion batteries instead of lithium ion, so they don't need the expense of lithium, right? So what they're doing is they're using tea leaf stems, coffee grounds, and other ways to make sodium ion powered EV batteries. Now, they've already made some. They haven't mass produced them yet, but they know that they actually do work. So I guess the world's going to have to drink more tea and coffee so all the waste can be used to make batteries. Then you got to collect it too. I mean, does anybody look at the mass problem of this? What are they going to do? Go to the coffee shops out of houses and collect the coffee grounds and the tea leaf stems? I mean, yeah, you can do this, but where are you going to get it all from? The massive amount of energy that we use these days? People drink enough coffee as it is, right? They're all jittery. But <laughs> who's going to collect these coffee grounds? Where's the stuff going to come from? Do they ever even think about the ramifications of what they're talking about? A lot of these things can be done but can they be done at an economic scale? That's another question entirely, right? So I wouldn't hold my breath on having batteries made from coffee and tea grounds anytime soon. Okay, 
You think cars are ugly today? Here's some of the dumbest looking cars ever made, okay? Here's this Ferrari. Now, does that look dumb? Yes, it looks stupid. Believe it or not, that's the back of the car, not the front. Another really ugly car was the Reliant Robin. Now, you've probably never seen one in person, but those are the ones that Mr. Bean used to drive around on his show, right? With the one wheel in the front, two in the back, and they're always tipping over and stuff. That was a really stupid design. And here's one of the ugliest Fiats of all time. The Fiat Multiple. <laughs> Look at that. Man, is that ugly. Then, of course, there's a 1960 Plymouth Valiant. Look at that thing. Man, is that ugly. <laughs> That's right. I always thought those things were ugly. Now, this may be the ugliest one of all. It's called the Amber. It's a Russian electric vehicle. I mean, check that out. A frogish something. I don't know. what. It's really ugly. Then there's the Hyundai Tiburon. Look at that. They took an old 90 Celica front and put it on the back of God knows what. And then they came up with this thing. Last but not least is Daihatsu Kopu. Look, if you're following that thing, you're wondering, what the heck is that in front of me? It's kind of gawking back at me. Yeah, there have been some pretty ugly car designs. I suppose they'll continue to make really ugly car designs as time goes on, but you really can't find much uglier than these things. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.